Jacques Swart. Welcome. Thank you, Brendan. Nice to be here. Yeah, we're uh, very happy that you're here. Um, we've known each other a long time. We've had some short discussions in the past. Thought it'd be good for us to converse a little um, about the world of physios and doctors and the combination and, and love-hate relationships that occur. Um, so Well Health Pro, this is your new venture. Yes. Tell us about it. Well Health Pro is a company that wants to empower physios to actually bring education to the patients. So I'm quite passionate and you talk about short discussions, I'll say we had very long discussions. Yeah. And empowering the patient is quite a new thing in the industry. Um, usually when you see a professional, either a doctor, a physio, whoever you see as a professional, they tend to hold all the information and they dispense the information. and the transaction basically you pay a fee for information and we're not keen on that we want our patients to be able to get most of the information if not all themselves yes i mean on that point um part of new human's concept is that medical like self medical surveillance and having data on your own body and healing oneself and having that data and information is primary in the future. The future is a world where we have information and education to heal ourselves. And that's where it's going. 100%. I agree. And that's why I love your model, because that's, the way, that's where we're going. Mm. We've got Fitbits. We've got Tracker. We, for the first time in history, able to know what our heart rate is throughout the day. We're able to get more information. And limiting the information is what professionals often do i have colleagues and um often in conferences you always hear my degree is not a google degree but i always take the opposite road and say listen your patient is trying to get information you there to help them sift so your patient comes to you and have a discussion say i've read this and this and this what's your take yes now i can understand why it doesn't work for the professional because unfortunately it takes time Mm. But building a relationship, health is about building a relationship. Yes. You can't have wellness and health yes. without that relationship. Agreed. You, you, there is a relationship and it's fundamental in, in longevity. Um, we, we see the problem in the system. The system has, has put a position in place for a lot of our professionals that time constraints um, and and obviously the concept whereby patient in, patient out, um, it's hard to build relationships in that environment. So the, f the construct must change. The Definitely. future of health and wellness is building relationships and helping people understand the data on their bodies. Definitely. Yeah. Carry on, yeah. Definitely. So especially having, having people there to monitor and give advice and making it a process instead of a single intervention. Health is not a single intervention. It fluctuates. You're going to be healthy or feel better one day and the next day maybe not. It's not about just for that spike. It's we a, want it, to control yeah. the band, not too poorly and not overly manic. Yes. So that's the positive side and negative side. We want to try and get you into a band which we can almost call wellness. Yes. And that's the idea. Absolutely, I, I agree, and I, I think if we could, if I can refer to blood work, you know, most people are unaware that blood work is a snapshot in time. At that moment, that's what your cholesterol levels at. At that moment, that's what your glucose levels are at. But that can change day to day. It is a extracellular test that is a day to day test. You you cannot use blood work only as a test of consistent health or disease trending. So. The medical industry at some point need to bring in tests which can give us better idea of disease trends, potentially intracellular testing. And that's just a, f a small example of what you're referring to. We, we need more comprehensive holistic health. We need physios to work with doctors, to work with neurologists. A team of people should be responsible for an individual's health. 100% agree. Some of my background, I've worked in high-level sports, and then you work as a multidisciplinary team. The results are always great. The interaction is so important between all your health professionals and then where you actually gain your health from. 
if you're in a gym environment and exercising, that's already part, a major part of your health and wellness right there. If that system is not interacting because we're making a split from a pure medical side to uh, exercise science or sport and conditioning side, we're losing the plot. It is a single system where yes. we want to be in the same position to help the patient or to help the individual. Absolutely. I mean, holistic health is what it says it is. It's holistic. You need, it's a multidisciplinary process. So um, at this stage, I mean, uh, you, you see a lot of our patients at Newman, um, well-known. Um, my, my question to you is, somebody has an injury. What is the steps that they should follow before running off potentially to a GP first, who, who unfortunately does have limited knowledge on sport injury. Okay, what is the steps? I mean, how should they go about the process? Yeah, that's a very interesting question and is probably what I deal with the most. So in terms of how the health setup currently in South Africa, um, we're able to intervene at different levels. So you've got the rehabilitation side, which often is physio, bio, chiropractor side. We've got the GP, and then we've got the sports physician. Now, the sports physician is a sub-specialized GP. It's not a specialist on its own. This person has got more knowledge in terms of physical injuries and exercise knowledge, diet knowledge, and works a little bit more as a specialized GP for sport injuries or physical injuries. And then, of course, we get the specialist at the top. Now, if we talk about physical injury, it's the orthopedic surgeon. So our problem is if we take a look at other countries and how they model it, you initially end up on the lowest form of the period of the pyramid, which is the physio. So when you come and see me, I often have patients that have been everywhere, gotten a hundred opinions, yeah. and that's delayed treatment. And from the patient's side, they've got so much information and we're not providing a clear-cut route for them. So if I can sum it up and give a clear-cut route, we are in a new phase in what we think about, like we talked about holistic healing. You're often, you often get a good recipe if you see a GP. They'll go in, they'll prescribe you anti-inflammatories, anti something for the pain, and maybe a muscle relaxant. But let's say your injury is not inflammatory in origin. Yes. A lot of stuff, the stuff isn't. And now we get to a very controversial point where most of the time for active individuals, we don't want you to take an anti-inflammatory. That's a very controversial point. We started off saying, wait 24 hours, wait 48, wait 72. Now, unless there's indications, because why we take anti-inflammatories is to prevent inflammation, but inflammation is how the healing process starts. Yes. So now you come in for a, for assessment or treatment, you are full of anti-inflammatories, so you've stopped the healing process already, your body's struggling to adapt. We can make the diagnosis, but we weeks behind in terms of yeah. how you respond. And often what you'll hear from other professionals is, well, rest, just rest for two or, f or four weeks or six weeks. And that's often patients from New Human that are training daily. They come in and they're told or advised certain things. You, you need a rest a little bit, but often, mostly, not more than 72 hours. Yes. And the nice thing with exercise is if you've got an upper limb injury, let's say in the shoulder, you can train lower body. Your healing is better. And we talked about blood work. If you take a look at someone who's training, how they heal versus someone who's resting. Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, we... Let's just jump back a second. Somebody has a shoulder impingement or a supraspinata injury or, or some tear or something. We have, let's talk about contralateral training because a lot of people don't know what that is all about. What, give us a, like a definition. What does that mean for the patient that's got a shoulder injury and is told, no, he shouldn't go and train? What is your opinion? I mean, what can we do for somebody like that? Yeah, I, I think you know my answer to that. <laughs> I will encourage training unless it's unsafe for the patient. Yes. That is, I think, the bottom line. Can you prove that it's unsafe? Because if we look at all the benefits, not just in terms of mood stabilization, 
um, diet stabilization, the metabolism running. Let's talk just about the healing. If you are training and you are able to heal better and quicker, these problems tend not to accumulate with more and more training. Yes. So we want that person in there. And to answer your question on the contralateral training, that's a very interesting concept where we know that if you train one arm, let's say you train the left arm, you're doing a bicep curl. Irrespective, your right side has got a 30 to 40% contraction of the same muscle groups. Yes. Because it's a, uh, it starts in the brain where we've got mirror cells or glial cells that mirror movement. We want to mirror movement. So if you are training and you are doing 100 reps, you can think of it, you're doing probably 30 to 40 reps in this injured arm. Think how great that healing is. Think about how great that supply of healing cells of course. goes to the area. Yeah, I mean, you've got a higher blood supply. You, you know, you, you have, you're definitely going to be driving more nutrient into Hundreds. that injury. So it, it makes perfect sense. I mean, we see it with, I mean, I spoke to an, uh, it's an interesting story, an occupational therapist a while back um, who works with individuals uh, who have sort of severed limbs and they've, uh, they've got phantom pains oh. and how they put the, win the mirror up against the wall and um, basically shift on the floor in such a way that when they're looking in the mirror, they're sort of crossing that message over while the OT sort of massages the good foot. And when they're looking in the mirror, it, they're actually massaging away the phantom pain in the other foot. Um, so it, it's quite incredible how the brain can do that. I... I we have always told a lot of the patients in the clinics that they need to make sure that if they have an injury um, in one, let's say, shoulder or a bicep, that they're still working out the other bicep based on the contralateral theory and study. Definitely, because that's scientific principle. And that comes back to what should you do? Well, because there's so many different opinions, we should go and say, what can I prove? What can I show you? And then interesting where we are now, there's not 100% consensus in the community about certain things, but I can tell you about positive trends. So you come in with the injury, I'll tell you, you can't do this because it's unsafe. You can do this because it will heal better. Mm. Then I'll tell you, listen, there's interesting info on this. We know that if you start supplementing with this and this, it can improve or it yes. can make it better, yes. faster. And that's the, I wanna say, the basis of what I think a professional should do. We've got certain levels of research. So I can say to you, this is the line, this is what you can do more, and this is where things are going. Research is evolving. I mean, especially in holistic medicine, we always focus on disease. Doctors are trained in disease. Right. They're not trained in wellness. It's yes. something they, tend to develop when they get older. It's, I, I don't know a lot of young um, medical professionals that tend to go in there yes. because they focus so much on their training on disease and what goes wrong. Absolutely. It's not proactive. I mean, cell biology is also left out in that to some degree. I mean, there's some, I mean, I've spoken to quite a few GPs recently and, and a lot, of, like you said, a lot of it is disease orientated. Not enough of it is wellness orientated. Um, and once again, the structure, it's a problem. Um, I wanted to ask you a question. Let's talk supplements, right? Somebody has an injury. In your opinion, what is the go-to supplement? Where, I mean, I've hurt my shoulder, something doesn't feel right, it's, I've got pain. From a supplemental point of view, what is your opinion? That's a difficult, that's a difficult question. Um, I think you and um, I have spoken about the hair tissue uh, uh, mineral analysis. Yes. And I like the basis for that because we can see where you are deficient. Yes. Um, in terms of repairing, it depends on the tissue and the structure. We've got some research that discs respond well to increase vitamin C and zinc. Yes. We know that a little bit better. We've got some information on um, uh, vitamin D. Yes. In repair. In repair, yeah. Um, in terms of anti-inflammatory, I think we've got basically the best research. We know the omega threes yes. are brilliant for joint health, inflammation, and manganese. I've recently read a fantastic study on uh, on, on on now manganese specifically for ligament integrity and strength. Um, also very good. Um, yeah, carry on. 
Yeah, and then uh, I think one that we actually use often and don't realize it is turmeric. Again, there's very good research on that. And the other supplements tend to have good trends. So we're ex- we getting there. We, we're finding out. We're testing it. We never really wanted to test it. Like you said, it wasn't in the training. And yes. pharmaceutical companies can't make a lot of money out of it. Um, because, you know, you can't get a proprietary blend so easily. If you tell someone, you know, it's vitamin C, there's a few ways to do it and the delivery agents, but they're afraid of replication. So yes. their focus hasn't been there. From where we are now holistically, we said, let's start looking at all the reactions and what can we then actually say happens in the cells and what happens when we take it. So in terms of that, and it comes back also for repair, protein. Protein is still one of the things that you need adequate amounts of protein to repair. Yeah, amino acids. I mean, there's the the basic, um, you know, branch and and, and all the rest, 20. I believe there's 22 now. That's recently. There's another one that's been discovered. So, um, yeah, I, um, I think I think you, protein is uh, obviously essential for muscle repair, specifically amino yeah. acids, the building blocks of life. Exactly. Um, we um, back to the mineral analysis. So we we do. So Newman obviously does do quite a few mineral analysis for a lot of patients. Um, it's done in a company in the US. Um, very professional. Um, these tests provide some very informative information on, on the minerals in the human body. And we know the role of minerals, you know, in repair and tissue and cartilage repair. Let's leave the standard supplement aside for a moment. When you train, there is a human growth hormone production, which, which we don't want to go too deep down this yeah. road. It's a bit controversial, but let's talk briefly on it. We know that human growth hormone is a very special 191 amino, poly, amino acid chain. Now that that chain, there is a lot of specialists I hear that are using HGH to heal certain injuries. What is? Do you have a view on that? Or so again, we've got some interesting research. It's showing positive trends, and I think that's the phase where we're starting to explore it. Um, in terms of speeding up healing, we've got a big drive to do that and especially professional sports you know that's where the drive happens we we're using now almost everything in the arsenal where um recently also we've developed the prp um which is the blood plasma so they take your blood out they spin it in a centrifuge and they actually inject it into the injury site and there we're looking again at the first trends of looking at what your body naturally uses or produces to start the healing process as compared to trying to get synthetic products in there mm. to try and do that job for you. So again, with the with the growth hormone, um, if we talk in sports that's not so well regulated, if we yes. talk about some of the strength sports, sure. this has been done for quite a number of years. Mm. Um, like, yeah, I mean, these, these a lot of these guys, what people don't realize is a lot of the guys like in strength sports or, or even in, in and cycling and you know endurance sports and endurance athletes they've been so far ahead with these type of healing protocols that most of the public don't even know about it i mean tb500 uh, this is another type of peptide that people are using for healing a lot of people don't know about the benefits of these peptides or potentially the side effects why are we not being educated on these things? I mean, for me, it's essential that people start learning about how these, um, you know, amino acid chains can actually benefit human beings in terms of healing, um, health, and of course, what the potential side effects are. Um, we've we've heard recently that there are obviously some difficulties there with regards to how we use these products. Um, but in your industry, I mean, everything is about healing and obviously the future is the, the quicker I heal, you know, the quicker I can get on with my life. So let's move away from that. And my question to you is if I've got an injury, why can't I go and have an x-ray done? Yeah. So in terms of how we look at it, 
Um, and that comes back to probably your first original question. What do you do when you actually come to me yeah. or should you do? Mm-hmm. Um, we've got a healthcare system that is actually allowing us to interact with those different levels. And it doesn't have a walk-in chain. So you can go and get that x-ray. You can go and get that sonar. You can go and get that MRI for that matter without difficulty. But it's going to cost you. So that's how the system works. You know, you're going to need a referral. That's, going- that's my point. Like, I can't go, I can't walk into a hospital and say, please, can I get an x-ray for my hand without a referral? Yeah. Why is that? What, so, why is that the case? So they want to, we structured our healthcare system from an actuary standpoint. So meaning your big medical aids, and I mean the biggest is probably the discovery, they regulate how your medical aid is used. So the rules actually come a lot from there. And then okay. we almost m- get a medical view on it where we say, but the patient can't interpret it. So it's going to waste their cost. Uh, they're going to waste, be wasted cost. They can't interpret it. They will need a professional. So in any case, they want to force you to go to the professional first and build a relationship. Yeah. Now, this is where the big thing comes in. Because when you see a physio, for example, the physio's main job is to diagnose you. Yes. Because again, when we talk about scans, if... I don't diagnose you. Special investigations, sonars, x-rays, MRIs, CTs are for exclusion. They are not for inclusion. We use it as inclusion, meaning there's something wrong with my hand. I've got hand pain. So I want you to go and x-ray it. That's the first step. That's why we waste millions on x-rays. Because the correct step would be to first diagnose what structure it is. Is it bone? Is it joint? Is it ligament? Is it soft tissue? Is it nerve? Yeah, because that w- uh, obviously, I mean, you've had this discussion. It depends on how the x-ray then would have to be done. Exactly. And, and, and et cetera. I mean, w- there should be protocol. Definitely. Okay. And, and that's the reason why I say the, the big thing is that your health professional diagnoses you accurately, tells you what structure is involved, what tissue, how long it will take. How do you adapt training around it? How do you adapt around your, your injury? Because often I get patients with low back pain. That's one of the big things. Being seen by someone, given anti-inflammatories, told to rest six weeks, and I walk in and I tell the patient, first thing I tell them, back pain is your symptom. It is not your diagnosis. Yes. So to say we're resting you from everything for six weeks because you've got pain. It doesn't work it's that massively way. Massively counterproductive. Massively exactly. counterproductive. You, yeah. you have a patient not healing properly. You don't know what's involved. And to save cost, yes, you're not x-rayed. I'd, I'm not worried about getting the x-ray or not. I'm worried about saying, at least have a working diagnosis or a differential diagnosis. We think it's a disc bulge, L3, L4. Or... We think it might be a quadratus lumborum injury, which is a muscle in the back. That, at least for me, is a working diagnosis. And from that you can treat. Because the biggest problem is to scan to find out is difficult. Because if it's a a disc injury in the back, x-ray won't tell me a lot. I can infer a little bit from decreased joint space. And that's the interesting part as well. I look at an x-ray a lot differently than your GP will look at it. I want to look at... The whole picture. Is there bone stress? How's the joint developing? Where do I see wear or tear? They come from a point and say, I can see this pathology or not. Yes. Is this wrong or it's not? Yes. I go and say, wait, 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 wait. You've got back pain. Let's look at that hip. Wow. Okay. We can clearly see this right hip is taking a lot of strain. Yes. It's wearing out. Yes. So we need to intervene there. Right. What are you doing? What are you not doing? And from there, I can build... A treatment plan yes and from trying to get the scan so that person would have tro- tried to get that scan at the hospital because they've got hip or back pain they would have come back and say well minor osteoarthritis minor minor, yeah. minor. and you're stopping everything where the treatment for osteoarthritis is 
loading an exercise. It is. I mean, we I see that so often at the clinics as well. I mean, people say, oh, I got, you know, osteoarthritis. Okay, uh, doctor said I shouldn't be training. No, you need to be training. Hundreds. You have to be on the floor. you got to be training. I mean, the science is there. Definitely. Why has it gone that way? That's my big question. Why has it gone there? Again, if we take a look at the approach, we, we've got, especially with things that aren't accurately diagnosed, a wait and see approach. So this means that when you see the person, and if they're not 100% sure, they do a wait and see approach. Like I said, two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, depending on how long they think you have to wait. And then they'll tell you, if it isn't better, after six weeks, come and see me. Because what they'll do then is they'll escalate to special investigations. They'll get the sonar. They'll get the x-ray. And then the next jump, because if that still comes back with no, I want to say, straightforward finding, which often humans don't have. Yeah. Complex biological beings that has used their body (laughs) for a while. Mm. You get the scan showing something. How I use the scan is I stress that, test that tissue. So if that's joint looks if it's got minor osteoarthritis, I'll stress test it. Does it hurt? No, it's asymptomatic, meaning you might have that damage, but it's not causing your pain. It's not causing your pain. Yeah, that's important. I mean, we need to know the difference there. 100% because you get a scan and you get everything that you've done in your whole life. That's a picture, but again, like the blood work, it's a snapshot. It's a snapshot, yeah. I think the most controversial thing is that patients think that this is how it looks. We've got patients that train where their x-rays improve. Yeah. They've got this idea, now I've got osteoarthritis and I've got, and I, they often say this to the patient, you've got the back of a 60-year-old. Yeah. I've heard, yeah. You, hear that you want a deadlift. No, don't touch a weight. Never touch a weight. How is the back going to strengthen? How is the bone density going to get better? Absolutely. How is the muscle mass going to get better? Absolutely. And there again, coming it's a self-fulfilling in, prophecy. Absolutely. And I mean, with that comes physio talking to potential biohacker going, hang on a second, we're recovering this patient. Um, increase the phosphorus, increase the boron. Let's make sure that the bones are recovering. Um, let's work together. Let's, you know, let's go talk to the GP. You know, that, that synergy is lost. Definitely. It's broken. And, and it's really, really sad. It's really sad because we could be preventing so much more. Um, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm impressed with, um, you know, where you guys are going. I, th- I think it's the future, definitely. There's no doubt. Um, I, I want to ask you a question. Before we have spoken about people and their, their pain, On a scale of 1 to 10. I know you guys often do this. And I want to know about the mental state versus the pain that they feel when you're doing this testing. Because we're very well aware that sometimes people feel pain that isn't really there based on an injury. Talk us a little bit about maybe an example or something you've you've experienced. That is a, I think that's a whole podcast on its own because pain is no longer what we'll call a biological indicator of the tissue. Pain is a complex process that has interactions from everywhere. Um, It's got your physical state. It's got your mental state. It's got your social economic situations. It's got all of this making your pain picture. And your brain is quite clever at stages, but it's also quite useless in other stages. Yeah. I mean, we talked about phantom pain. The limb isn't there. The brain experiences extreme pain sometimes in this limb that's not there. Um, It can't make the connection of the limb not being there anymore. And that makes pain a difficult thing to treat because it is about all of these factors. And that's why, for example, (sighs) patients don't explore their pain, the reasons for their pain or the associated factors. So patient comes in, And a good example for you is especially surgery. The patient is not prepared for the extent of the surgery because they ran to the surgeon, they had shoulder pain. The surgeon promised them a 100% return to normal, which I don't think is quite accurate. I'll uh, I'll, I'll say that you can can get better, but you won't get 100%. Yeah, probably like 90%. Yeah. (laughs) Maybe less. Maybe less. It depends on how good. But the patient's got this view the story this narrative that i'm going to be hundreds after the surgery 
Oh, and you have to do minor rehab, right? Weak area, let's say it's a shoulder, weak area already. They've got a weak shoulder. They've been told to rest it now for probably two or three years already. Yeah. Now they run to the surgeon because now the pain's just too much. Lifted a trailer or something, an incident like that, the pain is 11 out of 10. Medication don't help for it anymore. Yes. Tried everything. Taking high-level prescription drugs that has so many side effects. Pain's not controlled, right? Get to the orthopedic surgeon. You're going to be hundreds. We just need to do the surgery and you have a quick rehab. The patient's not ready for the trauma, for the amount of work after surgery, for the amount of dysfunction, discomfort. Yes, and emotional and mental discomfort. Mental. Mental discomfort. Um, I want to stop you there for a second because I want you to carry on. I mean, we spoke with John Henry previously and you're working with John and his bicep. Um, the amount of mental trauma that is caused after surgery and not clearly understanding what is what type of recovery we're looking at here from a mental standpoint is exceptional. It's, the trauma is massive. The trauma is going to accelerate or, or enhance the sensation of pain. Definitely. Let's carry on. Definitely. You are 100% correct. If we take a look at well-developed nations, especially the Scandinavian countries, Norway, Denmark, they actually have a psychologist consult you before and after surgery. It's a massive life-changing process. Yes. And we know from healing, one of the big things now in acute management, we call it peace and love. So we've changed from rice, it was price, police, now it's peace and love. Yeah. One of it is optimism. If your patient is depressed, not in a good mental position to heal, they heal slower. Absolutely. Or not at all. Or not at all, yeah. That's the horrible thing. They can do scans where they can look at blood flow and see this tissue is not healing. Yeah. And because we not working or we're not geared to those associated factors, and especially because your patient wasn't prepared for it, we get poor results. Absolutely. And some of the surgeons because they can choose who they operate on. They'll tell you, sometimes in confidence, I don't think this person will do well. Yes. I'll agree, if I've seen them sometimes, I'll say they're mentally not ready. And that's sometimes where I feel my job breaks away from the biological side. Yes. Because I'm gonna be the person that will take them through how it's up to the surgery. Yes. And then how it's gonna be afterwards. Absolutely. And if I can do that, my patient is better prepared. If I get a traumatic situation or a patient that goes without a referral to someone, they've decided, look, they've been with me twice, they think maybe they should get the MRI and I wasn't too keen on the MRI. And after I've explained it and talked about their fears, they decide MRI is the way to go because their neighbor, their sister, their nephew, that's the route they took. And then I get a patient that's almost broken. Yeah. And then we have to build it up. And now I want them to start training. I want to load them quite quickly because that's how they're going to heal. I can't do that because we need to then build up that person, their confidence, um, just their psychological robustness Absolutely. before they can even start to heal. Once again, psychologist integ integral part of the team. Definitely. Integral part of the team Definitely. that works with, with holistic health and wellness. And... People have this, you know, they have this view that if you're seeing the psychologist, there's something wrong with you neurologically, <laughs> there's some type of problem. That's not true. They should be part of every family's package. They're there to support this kind of thing. I'm going for surgery. I need to be optimized. My mind needs to be in a better space. Help me. And that's essential. And we all know 90% of disease starts in the mind and manifests in the body. So you would agree then that a person who's very optimistic has a very good potential to heal fast. Definitely. It's been the proven. science is there. It's been proven. It's been proven. There's no, there's no debate on that. Yeah. You've got a robust person. And if you think about it, if we talk about wellness, it boils down to robustness. Yes. On a bad day, your body should handle that. Your mental state should handle it. Your metabolism should, should handle, handle a, ban, a bad meal. Mm. You want to have a bad meal. It shouldn't affect you 
for three or four days. Absolutely. And we want in healthness and health and wellness to develop robustness. Yes. And that is a proactive approach again. Absolutely. I mean, I totally agree with that. You need to be robust. Your your intracellular energy pathways need to be working robustly. They need to be optimized. You need to be able to withstand, you know, what's out there, especially in the modern world. It's about optimization. And and I, I agree with you. I, I think that's a very modern way of looking at it. And, and that's definitely where it should all end up. Building better people, be, building better optimized people, building better mental states. That conscious awareness in society has to go up. We need to ha- there needs to be some form of education, and that's why I like your new company, the new idea, because we need to be educating people that there are other ways, and the world is changing, and you need to improve metabolically, physically, mentally, you know, all the components. And we need to, people need to start seeing that you need a team of people to work with you. So if you come to Newman and you're seeing the, the biohacker and you, you get your mineral balancing or your amino acid, organic acid profile, you're training on the floor and a low level light laser, if something happens, you've got the, the, the specialist that's gonna work with you physically, the right physio who understands the concept. We then have a GP that understands what we're doing there. Um, it's a team of people that are, are sort of molding your health and what do we call it? Lifestyle medicine, that's what it is. Hundreds. Lifestyle medicine. It's a perfect model. And yeah. it comes down to the fact that you being proactive, you're preventing, you're not reactive. We're not looking for the disease before we react. Yes. We can't be there. We have to get in front of it. Yes. And allowing these people, like you said, from top down to bottom, interacting, ideal. Because each of us brings something else to the mix to help the person. Yes. And that is our focus. I think we're all people that want to help. And looking at your professionals in terms of optimization instead of disease suppressors. Because like you said, especially in South Africa with a psychologist, you can get a few eyebrows raised. Mm. But optimization. Don't you want to optimize your mental health? Yeah, or your biology, yeah. You want to optimize biology because that is the only thing we know of right now that that creates longevity and obviously curbs disease trends. Definitely. Is, is optimizing yourself. And how do we do that? We need to be put in the right environment for that. We need to be educated correctly. We need to get the right people together to support the process. Um, and I know that like um, New Human and, and, and y- yourself have... have good synergy going forward with regards to the way of thinking, um, preventative optimization, you know, of the human body, longevity, anti-aging, et cetera, et cetera. Um, incredible stuff. I'm really impressed um, with with your, your concept and where you guys are going. Um, I think that we're going to have great synergy going forward. Um, I'd like us to hear a little bit more about how you're going to unravel your 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 new vision your your company what is the process going forward yeah that's a that's a something that's going to take a while but the idea is to not only the 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 target market usually for professionals or other medical professionals so usually the focus and we've talked about it before um you know even a podcast for example aims a target group at if you're a physio at other physios you want to help other physios. What if we open it up to the professionals as well, but we target the individuals as well, the people we want to help? And that, I think, is the company approach. We want to get the professional in, and we want to say, listen, how are you educating? Are you educating enough? Are you getting the right environment together? Yes. I can't do everything. I can't know everything. Yes. I can't let the patient think because unfortunately that's sometimes in our training. We don't want to seem that we don't have the confidence to help you. So what do you do? Do you rather say, yeah, I know exactly what, you know, you don't need to see these people. You don't need to do this rest six, six weeks. Or do you say, well, I'm open. Yeah. And I feel that's each medical professional's personal journey to open up, listen to their patients, importantly number one what's out there you trained 
to sift through, yeah. critically think, yeah. look at research. It is actually morally your, your responsibility. I often talk to a you lot know. of therapists and I say the ethical responsibility, yes. but you're 100% right. I, I, I hammer on a physio's ethical responsibility yeah. to diagnose first. Yes. You do not apply treatment. And again, if the treatment is holistic, I can't apply all of it. Yes. Of I need to interact yeah. with all of the people that optimize their environment. Yes. Whether it is their chosen professional or mine, it doesn't matter. But I need to be able to interact with all of them because we've talked about everything now. Everything interacts. Yes, it does. Everything interacts. And, and you know, that was the one of the original visions, uh, if I can say, with New Human Side, is that we were bringing the scientist together with the doctor, with the biohacker, with the psychologist, with the physio, and have this environment that people can come to receive treatment all at the same time every day to be able to optimize their lives going forward, to prevent any potential problems or disease or ailments that may come. And if something does come, we're quickly on it because we know your history, we know we're working with you. So, you know, that is definitely the future. Newman is now also adding an, an app where we can log all of that information. And all of if you join one of the clinics, you have direct access to guys like yourself, which is essential. You know, you have direct access then to either the GP or the scientist or the biohacker, who's ever on board, it's by merely a click of the finger. And we can get that information together, we can put it on one platform, and we can resolve people's problems, you know, as a team. We can't do that in person because it's difficult to move around from person to person. Yeah. But we can do it on a platform like that. And we can really, everybody can contribute to one person's, um, you know, lifestyle plan. And I think that is definitely part of the future. Provide the individual with enough data to prevent disease. Um, I mean, we, I spoke with this model with some people at Discovery. And I mean, they're very impressed, you know, uh, Vitality at least, and, and very impressed with, with the model. Um, so yourself, myself, a few other people understand the importance of holistic lifestyle medicine. It is essential. It is absolutely essential. And I can honestly say to people out there, if you don't have a physio, if you have a physio, find one that's open-minded. Find one that you can work with for the rest of your life. Because the more they see you, the more they, the better they get to know you. They'll be able to determine if it's more emotional, psychological, physical. They can work with you over time and get to know your biology. And that is fundamental. Find yourself a good physio and stick with that person. Don't be jumping from one to the next, to the next, to the next, because you're gonna, it's going to be worse for you. What do you think? Yeah, definitely. Having a good history with someone yeah. um, makes it easier. Having had the history, you also know who's involved with their care as well. So it's not just you. I, I think a lot of times medical professionals feel the need to cure a patient when they pop in. Listen, you have to save me now. Yeah. I always tell the patient, no, I'm facilitating. You're going to heal yourself. I'm going to use certain things in, within my scope to help you heal better, faster, become stronger, better, more robust. Absolutely. And whether I need a psychologist as well, the thing with the medical professionals is they tend because they feel the responsibility and I don't want to give negative connotations to it. I always say everyone's trying to help you. I, you know, they say, you know, there's good doctors, bad doctors, good physios, bad doctors. I believe all of them wants to help you yes. in their way. Yes. Um, but having the mindset that I need to fix you by myself alone often results yeah. in bad care. Bad care, absolutely. It is the whole spectrum. And like you said, if you start to know a person, and I always say it's about relationship building. For example, we don't do sessions less than an hour. It's quite common in our field to do 30-minute sessions. Education, relationship building, getting supplementary info. Yes. Training the patient takes a long time. Yeah. And that's why... When we talked about it, it's a time-based thing for medical professionals. I need to spend the time to get the results. Yes. And if I do, we've talked about it before, and it's anecdotal and I don't have exact research, but people training from the new human facility heals 
almost twice as fast as other people that I see um, from a sedentary background. That's an incredible stat, I mean, that it, you're putting out there because people don't realize that. I mean, okay, they're training in human, um, they come to you, you see that incredible recovery, it's a lot faster, um, but they're coming from a, a, also a, a different environment, a positive environment. Makes, makes it easier for us to work together. You understand what, what we're looking at, we understand what you're looking at. Um, and once again, um, we thank you for that. I mean, we thank you for allowing that information to go out there because people don't realize that. You know, they don't understand that that it's a lifestyle medicine. You got to keep going. It's not. It's not a. Okay, I need you to be healthy. Okay, now I'm healthy. Now I stop. Yes. Because <laughs> you see that a lot. Definitely. Um, if you have some parts of your body that you consistently feel are, you know, tight or uncomfortable. It's a lifetime process. Work on it. You know, if there's a weak muscle, work on it, you know, and work with your physio. Then work with your psychologist. Work with your GP. The other day we had an issue where we did a, a mineral analysis and we saw there was a hell of a lot of aluminium poisoning in an individual. So we sent the results through and we, you know, contacted the GP. I said, hey, listen, you know, this is what we're doing. Um, what would you like to add to that, you know? And, and then there, there was a little bit of confusion and a little bit of irritation. Um, we're good at the scientific test. We have scientific testing, which is, you know, is is very high credentials with very high quality labs in the USA. So just because it's not a local product doesn't mean it doesn't work effectively. And that's important. People need to be open-minded and work together, as you say. Um, if you mention, and you've noticed a lot of times I'd phone you and say, hey, uh, Yaku, listen, there's an issue here. What's your opinion? What do you think? And we, we converse, we talk, we try to find a solution uh, together. Now, if we just had the rest of the, the team in there, I mean, the healing process, the optimization, you know, it's just, it's there. It's quicker. It's more effective. 100%. I, I, think, I think an interesting thing that you also said is interacting with other professionals. Um, it is sometimes strange. It is sometimes things that you're not used to. I always say, you know, the primary thing is this patient. Um, challenging beliefs of the patient is a technique you can do in treatment, but it can backfire quite often. Mm. So if a patient is training at your facility for the past 10 years, you helped them lost 60 kilograms. They've reduced the medication to almost nothing. No longer a risk for high blood pressure, cholesterol. And they go to someone and you give analysis and they don't respond well, the patient is clearly using you as a provider, clearly favoring you, have a relationship with you, challenging the belief for the patient saying, yeah, you know, I'm not going to do that, or I don't work with them, or I don't believe in this. Yes. That's a bold strategy to get the patient just away from your office. Absolutely. I agree. Because you're not helping that you're person. Not help, you're not helping that person. You've, I always said, like, uh, like I said earlier as well, we are trained to interpret research. Yes. And there's certain things, you know, I can't, I can't speak about things that I don't have research about. And I always say to the patient, I'm not going to give you my personal opinion because you're there for a professional consult. Yes. My friends can get a personal opinion, but from there I'll tell you, this is what I can say from the research. Yeah. Or I don't know exactly, I will find out and phone you because it's okay to say, I don't know exactly. I need to brush up on that. But there's certain therapies and things, if I don't know about it, I can't comment on Absolutely. it. Absolutely. But the first thing I'm not going to do is not going to tell the patient, you know, this is wrong. It's wrong for you. Yeah. 15 or, or, years ago. Yeah, or there isn't enough science to back that up. I mean, this is just, that's just really bad. 15 years ago, working at a high performance facility, when I was treating athletes, I would have medical professionals phoning me and say, this person's got back injuries. Why am I prescribing deadlifts? I must be out of my mind. My, my, my license should be pulled. Who do I think I am? And at that stage, I could tell them, listen, I've got three or four studies that I can send you. I think we can maybe discuss this. Yeah. Um, I can show you where the research is going. Yeah, let's, have, let's sit down. Let's have, a, let's have a short conversation. As time went on, my answer was, listen, I've got a folder of systematic reviews, randomized control trials, opinion pieces, 
I mean massive amounts of of research. research. Yeah. Why I'm treating the deadlift with resistance, uh, uh, treating the disc injury with uh, resistance training. I can send you the folder. And I always say, I don't want to be that guy. I, I hear you. I don't want to be that guy that shoots down something. But again, as a medical professional, I've got a duty to say, listen, I don't know. But I say, always be keen to find out. Yes, you've got a question. You've got to be inquisitive about it, yeah. 15 years from now, that might be the standard. And like you've been saying the whole time, I really believe lifestyle medicine will become the standard. Definitely. If it's 15 or 20 years from now, if I'm no longer here, it doesn't matter, but it is going to become the standard. Agreed. Lifestyle medicine is the future, there's no doubt. And and just to add to what happened to you, we had a, a patient that came to us, struggled with obviously obesity, um, high blood pressure, cholesterol, Patient lost 38 Ks. Amazing. A lot, of, yeah. A lot of people don't know what what type of trauma the patient has to go through to lose 38 Ks just to get back where they should be. This happened, and of course, then we stabilized the patient, got the inflammation down, got the emotional side where it needed to be, got the mind under control, improved that neuroplasticity. Then the patient went to the professional, the physician, the physician said to the physician, listen, I, I I, feel like I don't have high blood pressure anymore. Like I've just lost 38 Ks. Can we just have a look and see? So, so this patient's blood pressure was average 170 over 95 to 100. After the loss of the weight, it was 110 over 70. Wow. Okay. Consistently for six months. Wow. So the patient wants to, to ask the doctor, can we please go off the blood pressure medication because I don't no longer have high blood pressure? The response is no, it's preventative. Yeah. I don't want to go down the hole. <laughs> <laughs> difficult, difficult. Diffi- difficult conversation. Yeah. But the truth is, if we can prevent your blood pressure from going up because we're doing preventative medication, because we're doing lifestyle medication. We need to have the right people on board that can say, you no longer need this drug. You, are, you have cured yourself from this problem because it is curable. And a lot of obesity leads to high blood pressure. A lot of stress leads to high blood pressure. So when you've seen the psychologist, you manage your stress better, life is better, you've lost weight, you know, why are we on high blood pressure medication if I don't have high blood pressure? Same goes with cholesterol. I've lost all the weight. My cholesterol's beneath five consistently. Why am I on cholesterol medication as a preventative process? This is something that I, it's a personal thing. I think a lot of specialists need to be a little bit more open-minded. Like you say, step out the box, look at the research, go hang on a second. They're working with this company. We see incredible results. Their health, I mean, just by losing 38 Ks, your risk of heart disease, cancer, Autoimmune diabetes has dropped substantially. You know, let's let's address this from a different angle, a different point of view, and 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 look at it with an open mind. And in favor of cardiologists, this was incredible. Um, we had an individual that that had five stents, okay, in his heart. Um, obviously I'm not going to mention any names, um, but it was an incredible process. I uh, met this individual, he was in tears, he was upset. I've mentioned this before. Um, felt like his life was coming to an end. You know, he had this invasive surgery for him. It was yeah. very invasive, uh, a lot of emotion. This gent was about 25 Ks overweight. We worked with him. He dropped 25 Ks with the stents. Obviously this was not post-surgery. Um, Felt great doing exercise, loving his life. The journey's good. He's healthy. He goes back to the cardiologist for his checkup. Now he's on beta blockers. He's on cholesterol medication, blood pressure medication, blood thinners. I mean, the list is endless. He goes back. This cardiologist, incredible individual. I don't want want to mention names, but incredible cardiologist does all the testing. And he says, hey, your heart is perfect. Your heart is perfect. Whatever you've been doing, keep doing doing it and let's take you off some of these drugs because you don't need them anymore it was phenomenal 
And, and what a great response. So when he told me this, I phoned the cardiologist to have just a short chat with him. And I thanked him personally. I said, hey, you know, where were the people responsible for this? And he says, what an incredible job, you know. And since then, we now get, we get patients sent to us from the cardiologist post-surgery to help more people. And, then, and he literally decides if he feels that they should be off their drugs, he takes them off. Now, I can't mention names, obviously, because that, that is, there's some contradiction there in the medical world. But the reality is, what a brilliant man. You know, he's, he's outside the box. He understands that certain things are needed when they're needed. And once the repair is there, if the patient is able to repair, then why the drugs? Definitely. Definitely. Um, interesting. I always say the thing with medical science is it's still a science. We're looking through a keyhole and we're trying to describe a room. But we can test. So if you're at risk for high blood pressure, we can test it. We can monitor it. And it's become so e easy the patient can monitor it. So coming back to the original scenario, we can test for it. The specialist can test for it. The patient can test for it. We can monitor and give better data. Mm. It, we've got fantastic individuals out there. I don't think the people listening should um, get from the small number of interactions we had or we talked about the idea that there's Absolutely. not great people out there. Yeah. There's amazing people out Definitely. there. Definitely, yeah. And I think you did an amazing thing as well where you phoned the professional and said, listen here, this is how we did it. Because often we get disconnected from our own scope. Yes. Because we get trained. Work in your scope. Mm. Stay in your lane. Exactly. Yeah. So finding out and hearing from people and interacting, that's been my best teachers from different aspects, giving me input. Yeah. And from there, like you said, you build a relationship. Now that's part of your environment. Yes. This cardiologist is part of the environment. And again... The research is there for exercise is medicine. Yes. We're just not prescribing it. And a lot of the medical professionals see how difficult the journey for a patient is, how they relapse. So they feel, you know, maybe they're training now, but in a year, will they be training? Yeah, or will they be eating better? Yeah. So let's keep, let's keep prescribing it. Let's, let's not wean them off of it. Let's keep prescribing it because exercise is medicine is finicky. The reason why is because, again, it's not integrated. Yeah. It's like me applying one treatment. So often patients come and say, oh, you do dry needling. Some call it acupuncture, but it's called dry needling. I just want that therapy. That's applying a therapy. Yeah. Prescribing just exercise is just a therapy. Yeah. What new human does in it, you often use it, is it transforms. Yeah. Exercise can be a tool to transform. It's one of the key fundamental aspects. But if you train an individual, you don't just train them to do exercise, you train them to change them. Yes. And if that happens, it adapts. The person adapts and then exercise is medicine. I appreciate that. With yeah. just applying it, it's not medicine. Yeah. Because it relapses. And I think that's where your biggest issue with that comes from. There's just too many people that see patients on the regular basis that just gets used to the fact that patients relapse. Yeah. They lost 25 Ks, now they're up 30. Now they go back, yeah. yeah. And I think changing the mindset for them, how this therapy is applied, will cause the bigger change. And yeah. the proof is in the pudding. The more the results are there, the more the people see it, the more it will get out there. Definitely. And, and you're so right because it is an environment of holistic lifestyle medicine that plays a role in people in human transformation. We, we know the science at this stage, a lot of people are not aware of this, but you know, f fat cells like adipocytes, they don't, they don't actually leave the body. They're there always. Okay, so we're not getting into some controversial stuff, but they're always there. It is the management of the size of these fat cells that is imperative. And a lot of that, I mean, people think, okay, I'm going to take a fat burn, I'm going to lose fat. That doesn't exist. People are, they're just none the wiser. It is the management of these fat cells. And once these fat cells are drained for energy purposes, they will then refuel. And of course, 
you need to manage the size of your adipocytes. This is essential. And then people will often say, okay, well, how do I do this? Well, firstly, of course, your intracellular pathways need to be good, like glucolysis and lipolysis and you know, protein synthesis and all these things. But most important, your environment. Your environment, 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 environment. Because without being in the right environment, the body is not going to manage fat cells correctly. If you lose weight too quickly, your leptin crashes, you're going to then obviously be hungry all the time and eat yourself back up again. This is what a lot of these companies don't realize. It's like you can't help somebody lose 10 quickly or fast and think that the job is done. The job is not done. You need to change that person's environment. Without changing that environment, you're never going to get those results that you're looking for. Those prolonged, long-term life results come from helping people to change that environment. And that environment must include all the holistic health professionals and they must all be on the same page with what we're trying to do with this person a person trying to lose 30 k's is a life changing experience it is a it is a potential life saving process so the physio must understand what the biohacker is doing what the medical doctor is doing what the psychologist is doing and everybody needs to be on the same page so we go back to that process again once you, these people start making better choices and they're managing their fat cells better, all of a sudden their lives are so much better. And it is an environmental thing. In the environment, we know the environment signals the gene, specifically in gene expression and producing proteins and chemical pathways, which change different things. We can change. That's the big thing. But we're not educated to do that. And that's a major concern. We need more education. So I'm really happy that your company and that your new vision is to educate people on what physio is really all about, how to really save that person's injury without going too far down the line where surgery after surgery after surgery ends up destroying, you know, potential rehabilitation. So congratulations on that. I'm, I'm so impressed with, with the fact that you guys have gone in that direction. Oh, thank you. I, I think, again, because we work so well and we have the synergy and I think a very similar mindset, it becomes a natural progression because we both see what we need to help people. Yeah. And to be able to get there, we realize we've got a lot of stumbling blocks. And we start off this journey as the single individuals trying to fight a system. Um, and opposing it is not a good lifestyle. Yeah. Trying to constantly oppose isn't a res- uh, 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 any, any good way to happiness. And we need to embrace it and we need to change it. Yes. And that's the way we've got the system. Yes. You can complain about it or not. Yeah. But what are you doing to change it? I agree. What are you doing to change it? And, and on that note, I, I don't want to mention this doctor's name, stunning doctor, um, because primarily because this doctor has stepped out of the box and said, hang on a second, she sat with me for a while. We're talking about all the tests we do, like amino acid, organic acid, you know, uh, GI mapping, fecal testing, you know, mineral analysis. She was blown away. And she's like, I need to learn this. I need to understand what you guys are doing here because I need to integrate this with my patients so that they see that, you know, holistic health is the future. And she's all about you know, cell value and improving this human cell and all of that. So a lot of studies that she's doing in integrative and functional medicine now after being a GP for many, many, many years. So she's getting now onto the other side and going, hang on a second, there are other options here. So much so that she wants to buy two new humans. So two of our clinics, she wants to own it because she believes that this is where the future is going. They want to be a part of where lifestyle medicine is going to go. And and it shows you there are a lot of doctors out there that are incredibly smart with this regard, you know, that understand, hey, hang on a second. I want to get on that on that plane. You guys well ahead of your time already. You know that that is the way it's got to be, where the future's going. And um, it's really nice to see that there are a couple of professionals that are jumping on that bandwagon and going, hang on a second, this is where it's going to go. I go into that one-stop shop and everything is there for me. I can, I can get all the right people that's working with me for the rest of my life. That's essential. That's so essential. Definitely. 
Yeah, Yaku, well done, man. Really proud of you. Um, thank you for our synergy. Oh, no, thank uh, you. you. You're an incredible human being. Every time we have a good conversation, <laughs> um, your knowledge is fantastic. It's outstanding. I hope a lot of people that will learn from this. Um, and I wish you great love in your journey, great success. Um, thank you so much, man. Oh, no, it's a pleasure. Thank oh, you. I really appreciate it. I think um, from a lot of your, from your patient side, thank you for what you're doing for them. Um, I'm seeing them when they're maybe not at their best, when they're not feeling great. And they need the environment and they appreciate the environment. And I think um, for them, it's a, it's a good way to get back to health. And I think um, you should pat yourself on the back and everyone there at New Human because they're healing better, making my job easier because that. they're in a caring environment. No, thank you so much for that and for the admiration. And uh, I really appreciate the synergy and uh, we're going to do lots together. Thank Perfect. you, Jay. Hundreds. Thank you. Thank you.